Hey guys, in this video I'm going to talk all about how to deal with injustice, which is a big topic these days. And I'm not going to talk specifically about any current events in this video, because the truth is that while we live in a fallen world, we live in a world where there is injustice. And so we have this tendency to get so myopically focused on just this tiny little slice of reality that we happen to be living in this particular moment, uh, that we lose the bigger picture. And so I want to try in this video to bring a, a wider perspective that we can look at this and, and understand the, the significance of what's really going on. So I want to start by, by establishing a premise, which if you are a Christian, you're a spiritist, you are spiritually aware, uh, whatever religious label you happen to put on it, then probably you're going to understand that three things are true. In fact, I'm going to write these down because I think they're super important to keep in mind as we go ahead here. Voila! Now the first thing is, everything is under control. Two, everything will turn out exactly as it is supposed to. And three, God's justice is perfect. If we can keep these three things in mind, then we'll understand exactly why, what is going on and why it is going on. We have to remember that from our vantage point, we have very little visibility into the entirety of everything that is going on in the world. We understand just a little bit of information that we are privy to and a, just a little time period that, that we understand. So we have to first have the humility to recognize that what we know is just a tiny fraction uh, of the important details that there are to know. And so we have to have the humility to, to let go and trust God that uh, he knows everything, he knows all the variables and that he knows everything that's going on and that the situation is under control. And then we say that God's justice is perfect and probably most people would agree with that. But then on the other hand, we see things that look like injustice happening in the world. We see people getting murdered. We see people starving. We see people getting put in jail even though they're innocent. We see a lot of what looks like injustice in the world and it's kind of hard to reconcile that sometimes with the idea that God's justice is perfect. And the problem again is that we're just focused on a very limited perspective. If we can widen our perspective, we can see how even apparent, apparent injustice may actually add up to justice in the final accounting. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say that I commit some injustice against somebody else. Let's say that I burglarize somebody's house, for example, and I don't get caught, I don't get it, go to jail. Well, I have clearly committed an act of injustice. And by the way, when I say that God's justice is perfect, I don't mean to say that acts of injustice don't exist. People commit acts of injustice and we are responsible to not do that. When we commit an act of injustice against our neighbor, then we are violating God's laws. Um, and so if I commit an act of injustice against my neighbor, then let's say a year later, somebody commits an act of injustice against me. Somebody burglarizes my house. Well, what happened there? I committed an act of injustice against somebody else. Then somebody else committed an act of injustice against me. But if you put the two things together, it kind of seems like justice, doesn't it? The, the, the pain, the torment, the injustice that I afflicted on somebody else was then inflicted upon me. Do you think it's fair to say in that situation that I kind of deserved it? Well, yes, right? That's something, some, some poetic justice, you might call it, that the same thing that I did to somebody else happened to me. Well, what about the person who robbed me? Well, the person who robbed me uh, still committed an injustice. He still violated God's law and he will face justice for the injustice that he committed. And so in the final accounting, all the acts of injustice kind of cancel out. The acts of injustice all added up become justice. It's a law of the universe that if you do something bad against somebody else, then justice will be done to you. And you may be able to escape from human law, but you will never escape from God's law. Now, by the way, I know it's really easy to take what I just said, and then next time you see somebody suffering, you say, oh, well, that person is just getting what they deserved. So I'm not gonna help that person. 
that that person probably did whatever is is bad whatever injustice is happening against that person was the same injustice that that person committed against somebody else in the past so um i don't care i'm just going to turn a blind eye that is not what i'm saying at all the fact that we do not have the visibility means that we are not capable of making those judgments on a case-by-case -case basis. We can understand that God's justice is perfect, but at the same time, God's, God's command to all of us was that we help each other whenever possible, that we ease people's suffering, that we prevent acts of injustice when it's possible. If you think about somebody is suffering and you have the opportunity to help that person, well, maybe... God ordained that you were to be to come and help that person. That if you do not, if you fail to help that person that you have the opportunity to help, then that person is going to be suffering more than they deserve to. You are going to be failing to put to act your part in creating justice in the world. So it's not our position to judge people and and decide whether or not they deserved it. I mean, every bad thing that happens to all of us. It always happens for a reason. We always deserve it in one way or another. However, that does not absolve us of our responsibility towards our fellow human beings to ease their suffering and make their lives better when we have the opportunity to do so. Now, maybe you're hearing this and you're thinking, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense, but what about the cases where somebody is born deformed or somebody is born with a, a birth defect or a disability or somebody's parents die uh, right after birth? How could, they, how could that possibly be justice? What the, did they do to deserve that? And the answer to that is twofold. And uh, a really instructive story is when Jesus healed the man who was born blind. Jesus and his disciples, if you recall the story, they came up upon a man who had been born blind, and the disciples asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it because he sinned or because his parents sinned? Now, just stopping right there, it's very interesting that the disciples recognize that the possibility that it could be because the man himself sinned. Now, the man was born blind. He was born that way. So whatever sin he committed must have happened before he was born. And this is something that a lot of Christians have a hard time wrapping our heads around because we tend to assume that when an egg cell meets a sperm cell, then God snaps his fingers and a new spirit comes into existence to inhabit that new body. But there's really no reason to believe that. In fact, if you believe what the Bible says, then that is clearly not the case. It's said many times throughout scriptures. One example is Jeremiah 1.5. God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So the soul exists for some amount of time before the body comes into existence. And whether or not the soul is capable of sin during that time is illustrated by this story where the disciples asked if the man sinned basically before he was born, which is quite possible. And Jesus does not rebuke that, by the way. He does say that that's not the reason in this particular case. He says that it was uh, to show the glory of God, which brings me to actually the second. I told you there were two reasons that, that pain, that suffering happens in your life. One is to get you out of a sinful behavior. Right is a punishment, so to speak, for a sinful behavior, which I'll explain a little bit later on how exactly that works, because God's idea of punishment is a lot different than human idea of punishment. And then the second reason is because the reward is greater than the cost, which is something that we should be intimately familiar with. I mean, earlier today, uh, I, went, I went for a run outside in the 90 degree heat. I didn't do it because I thought it would feel good, I didn't do it because it, it was pleasurable for me. In fact, I was making a sacrifice. I was enduring some discomfort because I believed that the reward would be greater than the pain. So sometimes we have pain in our lives. Sometimes it's placed upon us by God and sometimes it's self-inflicted in the case of me running in the 90 degree weather. Uh, but we have this pain in our life because we recognize, or God recognizes, that the reward of it will be greater than the Which actually is always true, and that's the reason that God punishes us, so to speak, for our sins. See, God's justice works a little bit differently than human justice. 
in human justice, if I burglarize somebody's house, then I get put in prison for five years, or I get put in prison for 10 years. I, the, my sentence is proportional to the crime that I committed. However, in God's justice, God, God does not, is not interested in making you suffer for the, the sake of making you suffer. God's interest in uh, making you suffer is only, only so that you will see the error of your ways and you will correct them. So a lot of people have trouble with the idea that at the same time God is just, but God is also forgiving. How does that make sense? Well, this explains it. God forgives everything that you have stopped doing. If I do something evil against somebody, then evil things will be done to me until such a time as I recognize the evil that I have done and I turn away from it. There is no more suffering necessary than the absolute minimum that I need to convince me that I have to stop doing whatever evil that I was doing. So in earthly justice, the amount of my punishment for doing an evil thing is going to be proportional to the evil of the thing that I did. However, in God's system of justice, the amount of punishment that I go through is going to be whatever is necessary to get me to realize the error of my ways and stop. That's what it means that God is forgiving. The moment that you recognize that you have been doing wrong and you commit to stop doing it, all of your past wrongs are forgiven in that instant. That is what it means that God is forgiving. But on the other hand, if I do something wrong and I suffer for it, and instead of recognizing that I'm suffering as a result of what I did wrong, instead of changing my ways and committing to getting on the right path, I continue in the same sin, well, it stands to reason that I will continue to suffer. And I can continue to suffer for a month or for a year or for 10 years or for a thousand years or for as long as it takes me to stop doing what I am doing. And this is very much a universal law. It's a law of nature. It's, it's part of the law of cause and effect, which you can kind of conceive if, if you have a cut on your skin and you keep picking at it and picking at it and picking at it, it's never going to heal, right? It, it, you, can, you can keep that cut on your skin for your entire life if you keep picking at it constantly, but if you will take your hands off of it and let it heal, then it'll go away. And sometimes you may not even need to suffer at all. Uh, spiritists have an expression, they like to say that you can learn by love or by pain. So if, if I'm doing something wrong and you come up to me and, and tell me that I'm doing something wrong and that I should stop, if I recognize that you're telling me the truth and I stop and I change my ways because you told me, because you loved me enough to tell me and try to help me in that way, then I can avoid any suffering for myself in the future because I listen to you. Or I could do the same thing reading through the words of Jesus, reading the Bible. Everything you need is there. If you just follow the words from the get-go, then there's no need for you to ever suffer in the first place. So you can learn by love if, if that's enough to convince you. But oftentimes, probably most of the time for most of us, that's not enough to convince us. So we need to learn by pain. And how much pain is necessary depends on how quick we are to learn. So if a little pain will, it will get the message through our thick heads, then, uh, then great, then we only suffer a little bit of pain. But if it's a lot of pain before we stop, stop complaining and cursing God and saying how unjust the world is because we're in pain, then the pain will continue and continue and continue until we finally get to the point where we recognize that the pain is for our own good. It's a signal that we're doing something wrong and we have to stop. And this is true just as much in the spiritual world as it is in the physical world, although probably more pronounced in the spirit world, like I describe in this video about how to escape from hell. And so a really interesting illustration of that is that in the Bible, multiple times it refers to hell as a lake of fire and brimstone. And I always thought that was strange. It was like, okay, I get the lake of fire, you know, eternal torment, all of that, fire hurts, but why the brimstone? which is, you know, an old-fashioned way to say sulfur. Why is there, why is there sulfur in the, in the lake of fire? And the reason for that is that it's symbolism, that fire and brimstone were how, how the ancients purified gold. 
Which is very interesting because, first of all, it shows that the, the lake of fire and brimstone is clearly symbolic, right? This is not a literal lake of fire and brimstone. And secondly, it shows that the purpose is not to torture you, it is not to torment you, it is to purify you. You and I and everybody else in the world are made of gold, but with some impurities mixed in. And sometimes we require some pain and some torment in order to be willing to release those impurities. And so a lot of us have this idea that hell is forever, that hell is this infinite torture. And I just, I don't think that's accurate because why, why would it be fire and brimstone if it was to torture you forever? No, it's, it's to remove the impurities. That is the point of suffering in this world, and that is the same point as the suffering in the next world. Once the impurities are gone, then the suffering stops, and how long that takes depends entirely on you. That's entirely up to your free will. Okay, so now that we understand why apparent injustice happens, why it exists in the world, let's get back to what to actually do about it. Now, Jesus said that if a man strikes you on the cheek, then you should turn the other as well. And what I believe he was saying by that is, is not that you shouldn't defend yourself, but rather that you shouldn't retaliate. I believe that if you can prevent an injustice, then you should, but you should also recognize that retaliation is not the same as defense. And oftentimes, in fact, probably most of the time, we are not going to be capable of stopping an injustice. What we are capable of doing is getting mad about it and, and throwing a fit about it afterwards and retaliating because of it, but that only makes the problem worse. It's like a, a, a pendulum uh, to use the, the language of transurfing, it's a pendulum that's swinging side to side and the pendulum hits you. Well, what do you do about it? Do you push the pendulum back as hard as you can? Well, you can. And in fact, that's most people's instinctual reaction. If somebody does an injustice to you, you get mad, you get resentful. You try to hurt that other person. And if you can't hurt that other person, then you hurt somebody else. Maybe somebody who looks like that person in return. And it's totally natural to want to do that. But think about what is the effect of that. When you're pushing the pendulum back, you're just giving it more energy. You're just making the problem worse. Now, it just so happens that the man who said that you ought to turn the other cheek was the same man who is the victim of what is quite possibly the single most egregious injustice that has ever happened to a person in the history of the world. This was a man who was pure and blameless and who spent his entire life spreading love and healing to the people of the world and he was tortured and he was murdered. And what did that man who was suffering such a horrible injustice, what did he say with his dying breath? He said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. You have a choice. We all have a choice when we're faced with an injustice happening to us or faced with an injustice happening to somebody like us or to somebody whom we love, we can fight it. We can push the pendulum back. We can retaliate and keep the problem going or we can be the one to step up and let it stop with us. We can recognize that the injustice that is happening to us in that moment is part of a grander plan. Right? Jesus came to earth with the intention to be the victim of that injustice. Why? Because he recognized that the benefit was greater than the cost. Now, it's hard for me to imagine how, what benefit could, could offset the cost of being tortured to death. But I, I suppose that just re reveals my moral inferiority compared to Jesus. But if you will recognize that whatever injustice is, is being perpetrated against you, whatever it is that you're suffering is going to have, if you choose to, is going to have a benefit that's greater than the pain, then for one thing, it'll make the pain easier to bear, 
right? If you, I mean, you understand this, if you work out in the gym and, you, and your muscles are sore and you're pushing out that last rep and it hurts, but the pain just isn't as painful as actually injuring yourself. A, a damaging pain is far more painful than constructive pain. And then also if that pain exists to teach you a lesson, the faster you learn that lesson, the faster the pain goes away. The Bible says to rejoice in your suffering and that's the reason for that because the benefit of that suffering is always going to be greater than the cost. So, if you want to stop injustice in the world, then the way to do it is to contribute to a better world and the first place to do that is with yourself. So, recognize the injustice committed against you, recognize the suffering in your own life and rejoice in it. Let it be a signal that you that you should change, that you should start acting better. And then maybe do some good. Show some love towards the other people around you. Do the mission that you were sent to this earth to do and you have no idea what is the ripple effect of the good deeds that you can do. I mean, you might have heard stories about people who are on the verge of committing suicide and then one kind word from a stranger turned their entire life around. You could be that stranger. You could be that stranger distributing kind words. And what does it cost you? Nothing. And think about if you could save somebody uh, who's on the, on the verge of suicide and, and turn their life around and maybe that person will turn a thousand other people's lives around and all of those people will turn somebody else's lives around. All as a result of one kind word. If you think about how much good you're going to be doing if you're, if you're out protesting and out fighting and out destroying things, out, out slandering people, versus how much good you would do if you showed some love to people and, and brought some good vibrations into the world. You have so much more power than you probably realize. So I think that's it for this video. If you enjoyed this, please hit the thumbs up because it makes YouTube like me better. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the little bell icon beside the subscribe button so you get all my future videos. And I have a free gift for you if you'll click the link below. It is a little mini PDF, mini ebook. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> it's called the Eight Daily Habits for Success, Happiness, and Spiritual Fulfillment. This is my gift to you as a somebody who supported me on YouTube. So click the link to get that absolutely free and I'll talk to you soon.